Summarizing. What did we do last week? I introduced the, a large class of spin glass models, which are random Hamiltonians on the cube, on the vertices of the hypercube, or on the sphere. And then the question was, what, what's the behavior of the Gibbs measure for these guys, or what's the behavior of the free energy? And I gave you the uh, formula, which is the Parisi formula, proved by, essentially by uh, Talagrand, Talagrand Guerra, and, uh, and improved by Penchenko. The formula for the uh, case of the cube was really strange, if you remember. There, it was an infimum on some, something I called the functional order parameter, which are in fact distribution on the interval 0, 1, and the functional itself was defined recursively and in a complicated way. So for the, when, the, when the, this overlap measure, this functional order parameter is a discrete measure, then this function is obtained by integrating successively a finite number of times a very complicated functional and you integrate one variable at a time out of this functional. And that's the, that, that's the, the Parisi functional, and then you have to minimize. When, and I gave an interpretation also of this in terms of a anti-parabolic PDE, nonlinear PDE, which in fact does the same thing as I explained to you. The nice part, of course, is that it explains that the, this functional can be defined on all distribution functions, not only on discrete ones. All right, so it can be extended to, to the natural space. And when you take the inf, of course, it is quite possible that the inf, in fact, is not achieved on discrete measures, but you have to go to the limit. But the nice part of the theory there was that you don't really need those continuous, the, those general measures. You can work with discrete objects and then take the infimum. All right, so that was one part. Then we went to try to understand, in fact, how this Parisi formula comes, where, where, it does, where it comes from, and also this ultrametricity picture of Parisi for the Gibbs measure. So we did the following. I don't want to write that again, but we did the following. You take your Gibbs measure at fixed n and fixed omega, fixed randomness, so you have a random Gibbs measure on the, on the vertices of the hypercube or on the sphere. I will consider them as measures on the sphere because the vertices of the hypercube are on the sphere of radius square root of n. From such a measure, for any such measure, it doesn't have to be the Gibbs measure for, for our Hamiltonian system. For any such measure, you consider the overlap distribution, which is the overlap matrix, which is the following. You take an infinite sequence of IID replica under the Gibbs measure, under this measure GN, and then you look at the infinite array of inner products between these guys. This creates an infinite array of random variables. And you look at the distribution of this huge array. Okay? I explain how, in fact, the, the initial distribution is hidden up to orthogonal transformation inside this thing. So now the main object of study is the study of this infinite array of, of random variables, which are obtained by the, the overlaps of the, I mean, the inner products of the replica. Now, by the, um, so then I showed you the dovbish sudakov measure. So we say this thing, which depends on n, and in fact converges, I mean, is comp it lives in a compact space, so it has, lots, it, it has uh, limit points, the distribution of this. And these limit points necessarily satisfy some properties, which were symmetric, uh, non-negative non definite, and weakly exchangeable. So this meant by the dovbish sudakov theorem that these, every one of these limit points can be represented, again, through as a mixture. So it meant it can be represented as the, as the infinite array of overlaps of replica of a certain measure, G, which will be on the unit ball of a Hilbert space. So we started from a GN, constructed this Rn, the, the distribution of overlaps, took limit points of this, and then by the dovbich sudakov theorem, reconstructed a G on a, on a Hilbert space, a separable Hilbert space, abstract object. It could be little l2 if you want. The question now is, this, this G, first we can have many, because we can have many limit points, but can we you know, understand them? So last time I gave you the, the important properties of these guys. 
And the most important was the Guirlanda Guerra, uh, that if, of course, we cannot say it always is true, but if we can prove that this limiting object satisfy, satisfies the Guirlanda Guerra uh, identities, which I explained last time, then a lot of good things happen. First, so I, first, the, it means that the support of the, of the measure G is ultrametric. Second, in fact, it says that the, the distribution of this whole infinite array is characterized by, one, by the distribution of one element, any one element of this array, except, of course, on the diagonal. Third, it says that the, um, the Talagrand positivity principle, which I explained, and it says also that, in fact, the support of this uh, measure G, this random measure G, is not on a unit in the unit ball, but on a sphere. And the sphere in the Hilbert space is of radius given by the maximum of the support of the functional order parameter, which is, again, the distribution of one element of this matrix. So lots of information. So, and once we have that, we understand a lot. So the, the idea is, let's imagine now that in our initial spring glass model, we can prove some form of approximate Guerlain Guerra identity for the overlap infinite matrix. Then, going to the limit will have the Guerlain Guerra thing for any of the limit point. And then for any of the limit point will satisfy every one of the properties I just gave, right? Which will be... Uh, uh, very nice. It will be ultrametric, etc. So the and this is the basic tool, in fact, for for the proof of the of the Parisi formula, but also for the understanding of the Gibbs measure. All right. All that is very nice, but in fact, at this point, we don't even know one that there exists one uh, distribution in. Uh, it, um, one of these random Gibbs measure G, which satisfies, or one of these infinite arrays, which satisfy the Guerlain Guerra thing. Right? It's, uh, so it, this whole theory might be empty. And we will start here in, on a completely different tack. Forget everything about spinning glasses and all that. Just erase all this completely, and we start afresh first course of the second week, and we, I will describe a structure which is fundamental in probability, and that every probabilist should know, and probably every senior probabilist here knows, but for the young, younger guys, maybe you don't. And why, and once we have this, we'll see that this will enable us to define, uh, for any order parameter, a distribution of this overlap matrix which which has this as a functional order parameter, that is a distribution of one guy, and which on top of it will satisfy Guerlain Guerra. So we'll have an in, a very, very large family suddenly. All right? Now, this very large family will have nothing to do with spin glasses. Right? It's com constructed completely separately. Of course, at some point, the, the two will merge, because otherwise this will not be one class, but two classes. But the reason for, for them to merge will, uh, it will be easy to understand once I explain what the random energy model is, which I have not yet explained. Okay? So the, the model I want to explain is the following. It's, so again, no spin glasses, reset, right? We start, it's a new class. And I want to explain what the Poisson Dirichlet process is. That's the basic object that is crucial to understand. So I guess you've never heard of Poisson Dirichlet, right? Cinziana, have you? Do you know what it is? No. Alex, I'm sure you do. Uh, and Manuel, if you didn't, then that would be bad. <laughs> so here is what the Poisson Dirichlet object is. It's a very, very important probabilistic object, which is general, comes in. I mean, every time, I mean, if you have the right intuition, you know when it should come. And I will, and uh, so if you are, you know, it, it comes in stochastic analysis, statistical mechanics, it's all over the place. And roughly, it's the following. 
you should you have a great chance of seeing a poisson directly. This is very rough. It's, uh, this should not be registered, but beep. Okay. <laughs> so you have a great chance of seeing a poisson directly process as a first. It's the, the simplest object that you would consider. If you look at the following thing, you have an object that, that you split in many pieces, and in such a way that you don't have a dust of small things. In this very large number of, of pieces, some pieces are very big. They tend to be of the same size as the whole object. Okay. And then you look at the largest such thing, the second largest such, such thing, the third largest such thing. This ordered sequence of sizes of components when they are in, in the region where they are essentially of the same size as the whole thing is very often when the simplest model is Poisson Dirichlet and it's very universal. All right? So you, you take a big object, you split it into lots of pieces, and you are in a situation where each, some of the pieces, so the sizes of the pieces are random, and some of the pieces are very large, much larger than everybody else, essentially contribute to a positive fraction of the whole thing. So just to test your understanding of that, let's imagine you consider the total weight of people in Rio, right, in kilograms, or tons, I don't know. And then it's split naturally, of course, the weight. It's split into individuals. Would that be an, a Poisson Dirichlet? Is there a chance? No, because of course, that's dust. Even if you have very, very fat people or very, very thin, you know, there is no, per, no person in Rio, even in New York, that weighs you know, a positive fraction of the total weight. Right? That, that would be really ridiculous. All right, do the same thing now with money. I don't know about Rio. I don't want to say anything bad about the country that uh, welcomes me here, but I know about New York. Take the wealth of people in New York, right? Then you have the total wealth. It is true that there are some people whose, way, whose wealth is a positive fraction of the total wealth, right? They are really rich. Okay? They're not really fat, but really rich. So that's, that, that, there is a chance there that it's Poisson Dirichlet. I'm not just saying it is, but that's to try to understand. Okay, these are stupid examples, but I think the weight and the, mon and the wealth makes, you know, one thing, in one thing you have, everybody is kind of the same, even if, of course, in first approximation, some people are thin and some people are fat, but uh, for money, people are really not the same. All right, so what's some probabilistic models in which you find the Poisson Dirichlet? You find them, you know, here is an example which we will not address at all here. Take, uh, take a random permutation of n objects, right? Where is the Poisson Dirichlet process in this? Is there one, right? You, yes, there is one. Because if you take a random permutation, in fact, you split the space of n points into cycles, right? The permutation is decomposed as a product of cycles, and it just happens that the largest cycles are of size essentially a fraction of n. So if you look at the largest cycle, divide by n, second largest cycle, divide by n, etc., this will give you a Poisson Dirichlet, right, under the uniform measure of random permutation. You have a lot of smaller cycles, so that when you divide by n, this becomes like dust. That's the wealth of the poor people or even, in fact, in this context of the reasonably rich people. And then you have the large cycles, which contribute to positive mass, right? At the wealth of the 0.01%, right? So if you pick a dollar at random in my image of wealth, it will be in a big component. Pick a dollar at random. If you pick a, a person at random, of course, it will be in the dust. All right. So that's an example, random permutation and their cycles. And you have it, the Poisson Dirichlet process, maybe the best way to see it, is hidden in the Brownian, in, 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 in Brownian motion, in excursions of Brownian motion, in stable subordinators. It's, 
So if you want a very nice intro introduction to the, to the paper from the point of view of stochastic, to this, from the point of view of stochastic analysis, not the point of view of, classic, of statistical mechanics, uh, there is a very nice paper by, uh, and Vladas will appreciate that, by Pittman and Yor in, uh, in the 90s, which introduced a general class of Poisson Dirichlet, even larger than what I will describe here. And um, so here is now the way that we should understand the, the, uh, the Poisson Dirichlet, and it's related to this wealth thing. So imagine now that you have a family of IID, so IID random variables, okay? M IID random variables. And so you may be interested in looking at real random variables. You may be interested in looking at the maximum of these random variables. That's the classical extreme value theory. So it's very well known. I mean, this, the theory is completely elementary. You can teach that in probability 101. It is very well known that when you can, know, when you can find a limit loaf of a maximum process, Maximum var variable, subtract something, I mean, center, normalize, is there a limit? This is very well understood. We know an if and only if condition for this limit to exist. And there are only three possible limits, not 25, three. Right? A possible limit is in the class of three distribution with parameters, of course. And uh, now you can ask, okay, so I know how to, to understand the distribution of the largest random variable in a, in a set of n random variables, independent. Of course, the, the story, if you want the variable to be correlated, is much more complicated. In fact, what we are doing, a, a Gibbs measure, the Gibbs weights are correlated things, and, and typically we are trying to understand the, the largest weights. So, but let's take independent. The second thing is you might want to understand, okay, I understand the first, the largest. I want to understand now the second largest and maybe the first and the second together or the first and the second and the, until the 17th one together. So you can do that. You can look at the process of all the largest things, properly normalized and centered, and you prove that this converges to a Poisson point process. And the intensity of this Poisson point process can be only of three types, because you have only three classes, right? Good. So now you could ask yourself, okay, I have these larger guys, and so imagine each of these random variable is the, the weight of an individual or the wealth of an individual. And now what I do, I order them, so I, have the number, I do the order statistics, the richest guy and the fattest guy and, the, and so on. And I shouldn't say fat, it's the heaviest one. And the, um, and then what, okay, and what you can do is look at the, the, the largest value normalized by the sum of all values. And this gives you the proportion that the largest variable is among the whole thing, right? So for any such thing, you define a random probability like this. So let me formalize this. Let's imagine that you have a random variable, x1, x, let's say little n. Careful, that's not a capital N of spin classes. These are IID random variable on R. And now I introduce the order statistics, which means I order them. And I put the exponent up there. Right, so I look at the largest one. This is the maximum, second maximum, third maximum, etc. And then I can consider, say, V1, which will be X1 divided by the sum of Xi. So that's the proportion that the largest guy takes on the whole population. Okay, and then V2, etc. So VI is X i over the sum of x, let me put a j here so that it's not the same index, sum over j, okay? So these vi's are what? They are 
such that V1 will, of course, be larger than V2, be larger than Vn. There are numbers, which are, of course, between 0 and 1. OK? And they satisfy some of, by definition, the sum of Vi is 1. So these Vi's are, a probab if you want, you can look at them in two ways. You can look at them as a, probability, a random probability distribution on the integers, right? Because these guys are random, of course. Or you can look at them as an element of the following space. Let's look at the infinite simplex, the space of, of xi's, of x's, which are such infinite sequences of numbers which are all between 0 and 1 and such that the sum of xi is less than 1. OK, I could put equal to 1, because that's what we have here. But for a reason that every analyst understands, this is a better space. This space is obviously, so you put on this space the natural topology. That is, the, the minimal topology that makes the coordinates continuous. Right? A map that goes from x to xi for any i should be continuous. This gives you a topology on this. On this topology, this guy is, of course, compact. Okay? So I say, of course, but that's why I want this thing. Otherwise, it would not necessarily be closed. And of course, my v here, my collection v, this collection of vi, you can look at it as being an S. So there is a little problem here is that this v is only def def defined at 2n. By just, by, by just defining vk to be 0 if k is larger than n. Okay. My sequence here stops at n, so let's just put 0 for everything else. This is a probability distribution, a random probability distribution on the integers, and I just extend it by 0. So any such set of numbers define a v. All right? So if these xi's are random, this v is a random element in S. Right? It's a random variable with, this, with values in S. So now the, the thing is, do, what, when you know that, these XI, that the, the law of this, so what is the extreme value theory, what I was des describing before? Extreme value theory tells you, for, which is again absolutely elementary for a random variable, it tells you, you, you ask yourself the following problem. Can I find numbers, a n and b n, such that when I center x1, the maximum, by a n, and normalize it by bn, that this converges in distribution to something. But can I find an bn? And then, can I find the limit distribution? All right. So what I told you is that, in fact, there are only three possible limit distribution. So the Frechet, the Gumball, and the third one, I always forget how it's called. But and and the extreme value theory gives you the, exactly like for sums, this is for max, gives you the basin of attraction. If, if I give you one probability distribution, it tells you whether it, it is attracted by, by uh, an extreme value distribution or another. And of course, it's quite possible that it is attracted by nothing. Right? Even very simple distribution never satisfies something like this. Right, so this theory is very elementary. And what I'm saying here, so one way, so this is one thing. And what is understood is that if this converges to some distribution, I don't know, mu, then usually what it means, there you have a better, you have a way which is to look at this. Some, you look at all these guys now, all of them. You look at this point process. That is, you have your cloud of xi's. You <coughs> center them and normalize them in the scale at which the maximum converges. Then essentially all the guys in the bulk, 
the guys who are not extremely rich or extremely heavy will go to nothing. And only the extreme value will survive in this thing. And this will converge to a Poisson point process with mean measure mu. So this, so this is one thing. This is another one, which of course seems stronger. But in fact, it's the same thing. When the variables are IID, if the maximum properly normalized converges, then the whole cloud also converges, but to a Poisson point process. Right? That's of course due to the independence. Which means if you have your, you, you put your X size, you have your distribution, imagine the wealth of people on the line. Then you zoom, you look at the, f the fortune, the wealth of the richest guy, which gives you, which is the order of magnitude is, is this, given by that. This is the center, this is the width. You look at the richest guy, you at the typical width in which you find all the other very rich guys. And then this gives you a window of wealth. When you look in this window at the points that are there, is what this does for you, what you see is a Poisson point process. Okay? So, and you have, so since you have three classes of such mu's, you have three classes of point process. So when is it that we have, so this is valid for wealth or this is valid for weight? Right? And the, um, and of course, this is a Poisson point process, but you could look what this, from this will emerge only the maximal guys. So let's first look at this. When will it, well, when we have something interesting for this limiting process here, it's not when we are in the weight case, but when we are in the, in the wealth case. And so what is the difference between the two? Is that if you take one the distribution of each guy, each XXI, it's clear that in one case you have a very fast tail, and in the other, you have a very heavy tail. That's what it means. Right? The distribution of weight is kind of very Gaussian, very, has a very, very sharp tail. And the other one has a heavy tail right? for, for wealth. So that's exactly what we want to study here. If you take, so if you take the x size to be IID, but say, with, but with a heavy tail, the probability that x i is larger than x is of order one over x to the uh, I don't know, gamma, zeta, right? A power law. So, what is the important threshold for for zeta? There's one zeta above which something happens and below which, one zeta above which you are in, uh, it's of course one, right? Low of large number. Because one is the place where the, the mean of x becomes, when zeta is smaller than one, the mean of x becomes infinite, right? So if you take zeta larger than one, then when you construct this object here, it goes to zero, simply. It goes to nothing. Every, so that's the, that's the case of, of, the, of the weight distribution. Right. All the mass disappear. The, the extreme guys do not dominate. Whereas, in fact, if you take zeta smaller than one, then this is the interesting case. And in this case, what you find here, this mu will be, okay, with, um, I have to be careful about the normalization, but it's probably this, uh, zeta, I'm sorry. <coughs> and then, in this case, this limit here, so then you have the, this Poisson process. So you can find the AN and BN, which are not very difficult. Converges to a Poisson point process of mean mu, which is this power law. 
And once you normalize them, and the V process, which is the collection of the VIs, as an element of S, converges in distribution. Of course, I didn't say, but OK, converges in distribution to something, which is non-trivial. And this something, which I will call lambda zeta, is the Poisson Dirichlet process with parameter zeta. Okay? That's what the Poisson Dirichlet. That's one example. I, I mentioned the, an introduction of the Poisson Dirichlet through random permutation. Or, this is maybe the simplest one. So let me explain that in words too. Of course, you have to know which the N, A, B, N are, but that's not very hard. I will just tell you now. I, I explain that in, in, in simpler words, basic probability. Right? I have this collection of heavy tail random variable. So I could look at the maximum of these guys, okay, which, which is what I call over there x1, which is the max of x1, xn. Right? What is the order of magnitude of mn? In fact, I'm describing what, what an and bn are here. So if I give you n random variable with a heavy tail like this, what is the order of magnitude of the largest one? So this is of order n to the 1 over zeta. Oops, not n, little n. Okay. You can see, do you all see that? It's a trivial computation to see that it's the, this order. Okay, the probability that mn is larger, is say smaller or larger than x, is one minus the probability that it's smaller. The probability that it's smaller is the probability that each x is smaller than x to the power n. Right? That's so that's one minus one minus the probability that x is larger than x to the n. And so this is 1 minus 1 minus, uh, okay, I could put a constant here in general, constant over x to the gamma to the n, right? If you want this to be of a reasonable order, you want c, so you want c over x to the gamma to be of order constant over n. Right? Let's say, let's say order one over n. If you have this, then this is one minus one over n to the n, so this goes to something finite. And this, of course, tells you that x should be n to the one over gamma. It's just the order here. This is what I'm saying here. In fact, you have more. You have that m n divided by n to the one over gamma converges in distribution a distribution which will be exactly this, in fact. Maybe there's a normalization here that I forget. Right? But the, the next thing, so that's the first thing. The maximum is of order n to the 1 over zeta. Oh, gamma is zeta, I'm sorry for this. The next thing is, what about the sum? So that's the two objects you can look at when you have an IID sample, the max and the sum, or the mean, if you want. This is, of course, well known. I have sums of IID random variable when the, when the tail is like this. You know that Sn is also of order n to the 1 over zeta. This is a much harder statement, but elementary. In fact, you know that Sn divided by n over zeta converges in distribution to some distribution, which is, in fact, the stable distribution with exponent zeta. It's important here zeta to be smaller than 1. Because when zeta is smaller than 1, you don't have to subtract the mean here. So it's really Sn is of order n to the 1 over zeta. Right? So this, this is, again, elementary probability, sums of IID random variable. So it tells you that mn and sn are of the same order. In fact, mn divided by sn 
In fact, MN and SN converge jointly once you normalize them by n to the 1 over zeta, and the ratio converges to something. What is the something? It will be the law of the first atom of the Poisson Dirichlet. So this converges to something tells you exactly this. I mean, tells you the f that the first this that that, that v, this in this language, this says that v1 converges in distribution to something. Okay, because that's exactly v1. V1 is the maximum divided by the sum. And you would have the same thing. You could also convert, look at the distribution of the second maximum, third maximum, divide them by the sum. They're all of the same order of magnitude. Right? And what this result tells you is something which is more global. The whole sequence converges jointly. All right? So that's important to understand. You need a heavy tail with no mean, with an infinite moment, to be sure that in, in a sum, so let me say that again, because that's really the important thing. In a sum of IID random variable, it can happen that, in fact, the sum is as the same order of one of the terms. Okay? And that happens when the tail is, is like that. If you have a mean, of course, or even better, if you have a second moment, you know very well, by the law of large number and by the CLT, by the central limit theorem, that no term here, no individual term is important. But when you have heavy tail, one term is important. All right? Good. So that's the Poisson Dirichlet process coming from extreme values of random variable. Questions on that? So that's very nice, but at this point, we don't see how this is related to, to spin glasses at all, right? Because in spin glasses, the random variable we're looking at on doesn't, do not look like they are heavy tail, right? We're looking at Gaussian random variable. So where are the heavy tail hidden? We, we need to see that there are some heavy tails somewhere if, if this Poisson Dirichlet is supposed to be important, and it will be. So here's the trick. If you, this, this takes a little bit of thinking. It's not hard, but it, if you take the Gaussian variables, the, the Hamiltonians are Gaussian. So the Gibbs weight are exponential of Gaussians, right? Exponential beta hn. The exponential of a Gaussian is not heavy-tailed, right? Exponential of a Gaussian is not heavy-tailed. You can compute the any moment of that. But they do behave as if they were heavy tail. So let me explain why. If you take now, let's do the same thing again, but instead of taking the, uh, the IID case, let's assume, so another example. To understand. Take the XIs now, to, or let's, let's call them YIs, to be IID, and say n01. Okay, now I take Gaussian things. So they fall off very quickly, and this cannot happen. But this is still true. Right? You can find an an and a bn and a bn such that the maximum minus an divided by bn converges in distribution to something. The extreme value for Gaussian are easy. This, the, the maximum is of order square root of 2 log n. Right? This is order square root of 2 log n. And then with correction terms. But what is the limit here? The limit now is not heavy tail. It's, in fact, the Gumbel distribution. And so, but the, so, so when you look at this, the sum of yi minus an divided by bn, this converges to a Poisson point process with an exponential distribution measure. Okay? 
So that's very different. It falls off very quickly, and that's, that's all there is. But now do the following. Do what we are doing for the Gibbs measures of, of Gaussian Hamiltonian. Now consider xi to be exponential, say, tyi. OK, so the yi's are Gaussian. T is a parameter. For us, it might be a, a, the temperature. So these guys are now iid. Right? What you can prove is that, and, and with, but this t might depend on n. In fact, our t here will be, with the normalization we're, we, we've used, is t times square root of n. Remember, because our variance was n for the, for the Hamiltonian. And here I assume them to be variance 1. So now if you look at these guys, then, so how should you think of this? These yi's are essentially distributed like an exponential. Poisson point process with exponential intensity. But when you now take the exponential of an exponential, it becomes a power law. Right? The exponential of an exponential when a variable is a power law. So depending on this t, the parameter, ah, it should not be t here. Lambda. Depending on this lambda, the parameter of this exponential will change. When the parameter of the exponential changes, I mean, the, the, the exponential of an exponential with the parameter lambda can become a power law, and you can change the index of the power law by changing this lambda. So by moving the lambda, you can go from a region where zeta is smaller than 1 to a region where zeta is larger than 1. And this is exactly the phase transition we're talking about. Right? So this is the idea. So in fact, in this case, you can prove that if you look at this sum, oops, that was a little lamb or something. So when you look at this guy, and which is the sum of these guys here, okay, maybe I shouldn't do that. You have a you have this transition from from a situation where a few guys dominate to a situation where nobody dominates. And, the, and this is explained in a very general setting in a, in a simple, very simple context of IID random variable in a paper by uh, Bogachev, Molchanov, and myself, right, which is a few years back. All right, so this should explain what, why this is related to what we do, but I'll come back to that. All right, but it's important to understand that this is delicate because, exp I mean, this looks like delicate even if it's not, because exponential of a Gaussian is not heavy tail. But in fact, it behaves as if it is heavy tail. And it's also important to understand that the, the parameter zeta, zeta here is not determined a priori. Right? The zeta will depend on this lambda, which I gave you there, which of course will depend on temperature. All right, so that was a story, an elementary story about IID random variable, which was supposed to motivate, and again, I could have introduced the Poisson Dirichlet process from many different things, you know, and um, now I will study the Poisson Dirichlet process for itself, all right? And at some point, fall back on spin glasses. So I remind, I remind you, I have this space S, and on this, I have this probability, this process lambda zeta, which is the Poisson Dirichlet with parameter zeta. And zeta is a number between 0 and 1. Okay. And I explain how you, you obtain it. So the, let me, and I want to understand some properties of this guy. This is perfectly well defined. Okay. So I tell you again how you do it. You take a Poisson point process. You create u, you create, u, let's say, u i. This, these are the point of a Poisson point process with intensity measure mu, mu zeta, if you want. And mu zeta is uh, zeta over, this is just normalization. You can forget it. Zeta plus 1 d zeta, uh, dx. So you have these numbers, then you order them. So, okay, let me explain what it is. What this thing 
So I, I take a Poisson point process with mu zeta, and I say two things. First, so let me list a few properties of mu zeta which are trivial, but which will be very important. So the first thing I need to know is that mu so is that um, of course mu zeta is sigma finite. It's not a finite measure, right? Something bad happens at zero here, but it's sigma finite. Second, uh, the uh, mu, uh, yeah, mu zeta of one infinity is finite. That's, all that is elementary, it's calculus. You just compute the integrals of this. Everybody can do that. Third, the integral of x mu zeta of dx is finite on zero one. Easy. Because if you multiply by x, then you have x over zeta, and zeta is smaller than 1, so this integral is finite. Trivial things. And fourth, I, I will need an important, a, a very important invariance property. Scaling property, if you want. Invariance property. No, it's not scaling. Of mu. So this one will, this is the origin of everything. This invariance property is the origin of Guerlain Guerra of everything. And it looks absolutely like nothing. So let me explain that. Let me, so this will be uh, the following thing. Let nu be a probability measure, any probability measure, on um, R plus. And I will just assume that it has that integral of x zeta nu d dx is finite. Let's call this c. OK? It has this moment. Then I look at the image of the distribution mu zeta tensor nu by the map, which to x, y associate its product. Right? So. Said otherwise, it means I take a random variable with measure with distribution. I mean, it's not a random variable. I take something under the, the measure mu zeta, a random variable under the distribution nu, and I look at the product of the two. Right? So this image is simply again mu zeta. It's this constant c times mu zeta. So you can imagine this is not hard. Right? Just calculus. But that's the fundamental thing. If you multiply something that you've taken under this by any random variable, independently of it, then you find again the same thing. Nu zeta is invariant by this very wide transformation. The only, the only thing you remember from nu is this constant c. Okay? So I think everybody can do this computation. This is a, a one-minute computation. So these are the important things. And what do we get from all these things? So I've taken for the moment uh, the UIs, which is a Poisson point process with distribution mu zeta, with intensity measure mu zeta. And so from this, I can find from, so first, mu sigma finite is important because otherwise I could not really define the Poisson point process. So the Poisson point process is well defined. Now, this tells you what? This tells you that the, 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 the mean number of points on the right of one is finite, right? Because this being a Poisson point process, this thing is the mean of the number of points of the UIs that fall on the right of one, right? So this number of point, since it has a finite mean, is finite, right? So there is a finite number of, so two here implies that there is a finite number of points of the Poisson point process on the right of one. Right? In fact, mo this means that there, in other term, there exists a largest UI, 
right? You have all these points. There is the largest point. Right? So this cloud of points is you have a few large guys and then a lot of people that are close to zero. Again, the largest guy is the richest guy here. There is a one richest guy, a second richest, and then a whole crowd of poor people near zero. In fact, of course, this, what I'm saying here in this analogy is wrong, because the, the poor people that you see in this process are still the very rich guy. They are the poorest among the rich guy. Right? The real hoi polloi are already at zero. They're, they've disappeared, you and I. So uh, that's two, and then third, then this thing implies that the mean number of the sum of the UIs, if you want, for, for the UIs smaller than one, is finite. Okay? So this means, so by two and three, So this means that the sum of the UI has a finite mean for, for the UIs which are on the left of one, for the poor people. So of course it's finite. But since on the right of one you have a finite number of them, the whole sum is finite. Almost surely. What is the, the, the mean of this is infinite, but, the, but, but it's finite. right? So this means that you, the total wealth, if you want, is finite. Then, which means that you can normalize. So you can define vi to be ui divided by the sum of uj's, of all j's. This is well defined now. So I won't do that. I will define this. In, sorry, I should first do something. Ui where UIs are, are ordered. I order all the points, which I can do because there is a largest U. There is a largest guy. So I know which one, which, which one is U1, that's the largest guy. Then I, take, I get rid of this one, then there is a second largest one. So I can order them, right? If, this, if the wealth was going to infinity, I couldn't do that. So I order them, and then I define vi like this. Okay? Then the distribution. So this, this collection of v is now obviously an element of s. Right? It's a numbers between 0 and 1 whose sum is, in fact, equal to 1. Right? This random element of s is the distribution of v is called the, of this v is what I call lambda zeta, and that's the Poisson Dirichlet of zeta. Parameter zeta. Okay? That's what it is. So, in fact, to do that, you could have, I could have not talked about IID random variables. It's just abstract. You take a Poisson pro point process with this intensity, you check all that, and, and from this, you see how that you can define the, the sum, you can order them, so you can define the normalized sums, and the normalized use, and this, this object is the Poisson Dirichlet. I haven't yet used the invariance property. I will, of course. OK. So that's the Poisson Dirichlet process of index zeta. Now, now I want to understand this Poisson Dirichlet a little better. So there's one, there are two things that I should say, maybe two properties that, that will be important that you can compute simply. If you look at the sum of the, U, the UIs or the, the, yeah, the UIs to the power A, take the mean, this is finite for every A sm smaller than that, zeta. It's infinite for zeta. That's an important property that's technical. And the other, which is much more important, maybe, is this. If you take the sum of ui square, also over i, is 1 minus, Z, I'm sorry, sum of vi square. This is 1 minus zeta. So if I give you the vi's, it's very simple to find the zeta. It's just you compute this 
sum of vi square, and it's one minus zeta. The second moment of this sum of vi square. All right, so we will need that, but that's just technical. All right, so let me give you the first, this invariance property that I gave about mu. I want to give it for the process itself. So what does this invariance property for mu imply for the process? So first it's the following. So let's take ui to be a Poisson point process of intensity mu zeta. So I've not yet ordered them in nothing. It's just the values of the wealth of my, uh, 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 of the people, say, if this is the wealth. Now consider v, uh, ah, v is not good. Zi, which are iid random variable, in the, and independent of the u's. So I take a collection of IID random variable. And I assume that the expectation of z to the zeta is finite. Right? Which is not much. Remember that zeta is more than 1. OK. Then I look at the following. I look at the process, I don't know. Uh, u prime i, which is u i times v i, uh, z i, I'm sorry. Okay, so I multiply each u by this random number. All right? Then the collection of u prime i is a Poisson point process of intensity C mu zeta, where the C is the expectation of Z to the zeta. So this is a very nice thing. When you have a Poisson point process with this intensity, if you multiply the numbers by IID numbers, then what you see is the same object, except for a shift in the, I mean, a scaling in the intensity. This is very, very, this is what makes the Poisson Dirichlet process so special. All right? So of course you see that this is this statement here, I could call that a theorem, is trivial once you have this. Because it's a general fact. It's clear, so the proof is goes like this. If you take the u i z i, right? This collection here. This is of course a Poisson point process, right? Because the u i's are and the z i's are i i d. This is in fact a marked point Poisson point process. You have given a mark. You have your Poisson point process and you have given a mark to it. And this mark is this number z i. And this is a Poisson point process of intensity measure. Simply the mu for this times the distribution of this. Let's call it nu. Right? So you have your Poisson point process, the, all this wealth, and you give them a mark, a random number. This is still a Poisson point process when you look at it in the plane. Now. So this is a Poisson point process. So the image of it by the map which to x, let's say to uz associate u times z is, of course, the process obtained by ui zi. And so is a Poisson point process with intensity measure given by the image of mu zeta by nu, which is just c nu zeta. And I've just done it. So I use here two things. I use the mark, the notion, if you don't know that, it's elementary. If I have a Poisson point process, if I mark it, I get by IID things, I still get a Poisson point process. That's simple. Whose measure is just the product. 
And then I use the very simple thing that the image by, of a Poisson point process by a continuous map, as long as the image here doesn't have atoms, it's still a Poisson point process. And so the only thing we have to know is what's the image here, and this is given here. And since this guy doesn't have atom, the image is still a Poisson point process. Right, so this is this. Questions on that? All right, so once I have this, of course, as a corollary of this, in the same situation, if I now take the, um, the uh, how should I say that? Yeah, if I take my UIs, I multiply them by the ZIs, and, I, and if now I construct the V, so I have my VI, which is my, my Poisson Dirichlet process with, uh, in distribution with parameter zeta. And then I have my V prime I now. Right? So I take my UI and multiply them by anything. And then again, I can order them, normalize them. This gives me another element, V prime. But V prime is also Poisson Dirichlet. With, with a, uh, the C on top of it, right? So I know the distribution of this guy. And so what this tells you is that the, if you take your U, so okay, maybe, uh, maybe let me explain that without the Poisson Dirichlet. So let's say that in a word. What is the difference between the two simply? If I take my UIs and multiply them by the ZIs, and I construct my new Poisson Dirichlet, that's the same, except for random permutation. Right? When I've multiplied them, then maybe the order has changed completely. Somebody who was the richest is now the 17th richest, and uh, that's all. But the distribution, if you forget who is the richest, the distribution of the wealth is the same up to this C. That's what I want to say. Right? There is just this possible random permutation. That's all. So let me not spend time writing this. OK, so, or maybe I could. All right, so the, uh, from this, here is maybe the more important corollary. So, In this context, of course, I have the following. If I look, look at the expectation of the sum of ui, zi to the uh, a, this is, of course, the same as, let's take an a which is smaller than zeta. So we know that this is finite. Because remember, these guys are a Poisson Dirichlet. So this is finite. How do you compute it? Here, this is the origin of the, of the Guerlain Guerra thing. So this looks like nothing, but, but it's very, of course, I'm taking this from the explanation by Penchenko, which is really luminous, beautiful. So this is just the sum of the UI to the power A times the expectation of the Z to the power zeta divided by A over zeta. So this is clear, right? In fact, because this is what I call C. So these guys are like, like before, Poisson Dirichlet, but there is the C now in front of them. So it's just this. Let's assume first, okay, let's do it simply. Let's assume that C is one, okay? Let's assume that C is one, then this is true. This guy is one, and I'm just saying that these two processes have the same distribution. So this, these things are the same, right? And if C is not one, it's very easy to go back to the case where C is one, because you just have to, div to divide the Z by C to the one over zeta, and you get back to the case where C is one. So by simple homogeneity, you have this, right? So the proof of that is trivial. Do it when it's equal one, and then normalize. OK, so that's nice. But that's not yet maybe very striking as something that we are interested in. The next thing is of the same type, but much more important. 
In fact, it's the limit of this when a goes to zero. It's this, the log of the sum of ui zi is, again, assume for a moment that c is one. If c is one, this is the same distribution of sum as ei, so it should be expectation of the log of sum of ui. And then you add plus one over zeta log of e of uh, z to the zeta. Right. Again, assume that c is one. If c is one, this is c. If c is one, this is zero. So this is clearly true. And then by just normalizing, this is true in general. Okay. All right, so this looks like uh, not much, but, but it's uh, very interesting. So in particular, from this I get the following theorem, which is the following. If I have my vi which satisfy, in, which are a Poisson Dirichlet process of parameter zeta, when I look at the expectation of the log of the sum of vi zi, then this is 1 over zeta log of the expectation of z to the zeta. Right? So why is that true? Remember that the vi's are simply the ui divided by the sum of the ui's. Right? vi is ui divided by the sum of the ui. Ordered, but when you take the whole sum, the order doesn't count. Right? And so if you take vi to be ui divided by the sum of the ui, you take this term, you subtract here, you have expectation of log of this sum minus, minus log of this sum, which is of course the log of this divided by that, which is exactly this. Right? And then the only thing that remains is this here. So this thing, which again, as I've just derived very simply from a trivial property of the measure mu, is in fact crucial. So, you know, look at it and try to understand what, what there is behind this, which, which looks like nothing, but which is in fact very deep. So, take this when zeta is close to 1. Right? When zeta is close to 1, it means that, you, okay, you have one richest guy, but it, the, his fraction tends to be very close to to zero. The mass, the maximal mass is very small. So this means that these guys, this random probability measure is kind of, it's not exactly true, of course, but tend to be distributed on a lot of people. So maybe some, maybe some law of large number will be true. And this thing will be like an expected value of disease. And in this, so here you will have an, and, and so the log of this expected value will become deterministic. This will be like log of an expected value, right? Which is what we find here. So when zeta is one, this is not very surprising. When zeta is close to one. I'm very rough here. But now look at zeta very close to zero. Then on the contrary, when zeta tends to zero, the fraction of wealth, which is in the hands of the richest guy, tends to one. Right? He is not only richer than everybody else, but he just gobbled every wealth, or the whole wealth. Right? So then it means that this, this thing was certainly not average. Right? This, will, you, this will not be an average. So this will be something like expectation of log of z. So when you move your zeta between 0 and 1, you see some form of interpolation here between an expectation of log of z and the log of an expectation of z. For those who know disordered media, it's an inter interpolation between annealed and quenched. Right? When I said that this will be like log of z, this is what you see here too. Put zeta t let zeta tend to 0. This, this expectation, of that will, this will be like exponential of log of z. This whole thing will become like expectation of log of z. So that's, this looks like nothing, but in fact there is a lot in there. That's the, that's the, that's the key. Okay, 
So let's move on. Now, I want to move on with a ski. I want to work on the ski invariance property, this one. And I, want to gen I, want, I will generalize it a little bit. You know, this property that I had here, this theorem, let's say, one, and then this would be two. Let me generalize it a little more. Which again looks like not much, but will, which will be important. Oh yeah, maybe I should break, yes. Let me just state this one and then I'll give the key invariance property, the one that is, that is really useful. So assume now that you have, so what I call them, ZIs, which are IID, and I need another letter. Uh, WIs, which are IID2. I assume that the expectation of the Z to the zeta is finite as before. And now I look at the following. I look at this measure nu zeta, which is defined by the expectation of z to the zeta. So I, I take run of ver, uh, z i, yeah, z to the zeta, one of w and b, normalized by e to the z to the zeta. Right. So this is a probability measure. What, what is that? I take the pro I look at the distribution of omega of w, and I take the density z to the zeta normalized. Right. This is a new probability measure. I define this new zeta to be this. Okay. There, it has nothing to do with the Poisson Dirichlet yet. Right. These are the marks. And now I look at the following. Now I look at the ui multiplied by zi as before. My UIs are my Poisson point process, as, as, as always. I multiply them by the ZIs. And on top of that, I look at them with the WIs. So I now look at this couple. Right? So I had this wealth of the rich guys. I multiply by a number. And then I add something else. OK? So this is, of course, a Poisson point process. Right? Because this, we know this is a Poisson point process, and we have just marked it again. I added something else on, on top of it. I have two, two things random now, the ZIs and the WIs. It's a Poisson point process with intensity um, or maybe I should write it, which has the same distribution, which is equal in distribution as the, U, the UIs. So that's, that we know, multiplied by a constant, multiplied by a c to the 1 over zeta. Let's call this c. So this first part we know. We know that the uis are distributed like that. That's theorem 1. But then here I should have a w prime i, where the w prime i are iid with distribution nu zeta. OK? So this tells you that the following. I have my Poisson Dirichlet, and now I have two marks. I take my Poisson Dirichlet, I multiply it by the first mark, and then I just add the second mark. This will be useful. Right? I just look at them jointly. And I say this is still a Poisson. So the first component is still a Poisson Dirichlet. This is what, or I mean, the usual, this Poisson, this is what is given by theorem 1. So there is just this constant here to normalize. But then the second here will be uh, IID with this distribution nu zeta. Right? So we'll, um, I mean, this is very easy to prove, but this, this will be crucial and we'll apply this in a particular case. Okay? The next case will be to look at these marks to be Gaussian. So we'll look at the Poisson Dirichlet multiplied by something here, and then this mark will be Gaussian. This will give us an invariance property, which leads to what is called for the for these guys what is called the 
this has been around for a while, but probably pointed first by uh, Bolthausen and Snitman. And then this will give us, in fact, the Guerlain Guerra. Guerlain Guerra is hidden in this invariant. All right. So in the end, what I, what I will have proven is that this process will define somewhere one of these overlap matrices with the Guerlain Guerra property. And then I will build on that, construct much, much more complex objects, which I call the Ruel probability cascade, but of which this will be the elementary brick. All right? Let's apply this, in, this last invariance property that we have here to, partic to a particular case, which is the following. Let's take the ZIs to be IID and define like this. ZI is exponential constant T times GI minus T zeta. Okay? Where the GIs are IID and 0, 1. Okay, so I take this. The GIs are IID and 0, 1, and the ZIs are essentially exponential of Gaussian, like what I sh showed for the spin glasses, right? And I take now the, what I call here the WIs to be simply this GIs minus T zeta. These are normalizing factors, right? You essentially take exponential TGI and GI. And you apply this. So, but the question is, what is nu zeta in this case? You compute. It's not really hard. So what is this z? You need the z to the zeta divided by the expectation of z, z to the zeta. What is this? This density here. Simple. You compute, and you find. So. First, let me compute the expectation of z to the zeta to the zeta. When you take this to the exponent zeta, you have exponential of t zeta times the Gaussian. So the mean of that is a Laplace transform of the Gaussian. You find exponential minus t squared zeta squared over two. I mean plus t squared zeta squared over two. Then you have this thing here, which just normalizes. And then what you find here is exponential minus one half of T squared z, zeta squared. Okay? And then this thing becomes simply exponential T zeta g minus one half of T squared zeta squared. Right? Simple. So, what is the distribution now of what is, so what is nu zeta? Remember, it's the distribution of this under this density. But this is, this is an N01 shifted in the mean by T zeta, and your density puts back the mean. So this is, in fact, simply N01. Right? So this is, if you want, the distribution of W is N0 and mean T zeta, or minus T zeta. And this is back in 0, 1, because th this just makes a shift in your. All right? So oh, I, maybe I forgot a T somewhere here. No. Right. So once you have this, this tells you, this theorem tells you the following, if I make no mistake over there, is that if I take my UI, my, my Poisson point process, if I multiply all these guys by T, G, I minus T, zeta, and jointly look at gi minus t zeta, this in distribution, this point process is the same distribution as the ui and the gi. Right? Because this is what I say over there. Same distribution as the uis and the gis. Gis being in 0, 1. All right. This, is, this invariance property is crucial, and we will see that it's characteristic of the Poisson Dirichlet process. So, in particular, a consequence of that is the following. Now, if I take the Poisson Dirichlet process, my VIs, 
that's my Poisson Dirichlet associated with my UIs. And now I define VIT, which is by definition VI multiplied by exponential TGI. So I have this, this weights whose sum is 1. And I want to multiply all of them by exponential Gaussian. Then, of course, in order to get something which, is, which stays a probability distribution, I have to normalize by the sum. Right? So look at this operation. I have my Poisson Dirichlet. I multiply each weight by exponential t times a Gaussian independently at each point, And I normalize. So this is till an element of s. And of course, what this says is that this is essentially a Poisson Dirichlet again. So it cannot be. What I just said cannot really be true. Because when you multiply each of these guys by an exponential Gaussian, by something, you may change the order again. So this is, so what, what this says is that there exists a random permutation of the integers, say, say pi, such that this vi T, the pi of i, has the same distribution as the vi. Right? So once you permute these guys, you get the Poisson Dirichlet. Right? So you have all these vi, the you multiply them by exponential of a Gaussian, normalize to, to keep a priority measure, reorder, and this is Poisson Dirichlet. And in fact, you have more. In fact, you have jointly that the this guy and the g minus t zeta has the same distribution as the vi gi. So if I want to keep the mark, these Gaussian things, it's also true. So this is a direct consequence of, of what is written over there. So this, this, this we will call, this is the, the boltausen Snitman invariance. And this we will see is very important. So from now on, everything I explained here, all these elementary consequences of the homogeneity of the measure mu, I will, I will use through this. All right, so let's see. How I say this, in fact, will characterize this Poisson Dirichlet. This is an in so you see, this is an invariance property for the Poisson Dirichlet. Forget everything else, let me summarize again. You have a Poisson Dirichlet process. You take, it, to each of them you put a Gaussian, an IID Gaussian, zero, and zero 01. And now what you do is you multiply each of them by exponential t times this uh, uh, Gaussian. And this now is the same distribution once you normalize after the, and, and reorder. So of course, how is that a consequence of the other one? I mean, it's, it's clear. You had to, OK, this, um, this is clear. All right, so now, before we go there, so at this point, I have introduced the Poisson Dirichlet, and I have introduced its important invariance property. Great. Now let's step back a little bit. How is that related to my initial problem of you know, infinite arrays of, of overlaps? There's nothing like that here. I just told you a nice story, but it has nothing to do with what we've done before. Right? So let's do something. Let's, let, <laughs> something artificial here, but which is important. Let's put this process. The Poisson Dirichlet is a process of weights. Let's put it on a sphere. Right? I want, you know, remember I wanted this Gibbs measure on a sphere of a, of a Hilbert space? Let's put it. How can we do that? So let's consider now, so, uh, you know, drawing Poisson Dirichlet on, push, push, pushing, if you want, Poisson Dirichlet on a sphere, which, so at this point, is like a little artificial. So let's take. H, a separable Hilbert space, 
let me consider now EI, a collection of orthonormal vectors. And I do the following. I just defined, so define my random measure, define a random measure G like this. You define that G of EI, it will be an atomic measure. G will be carried only by the vectors of this basis. And I define that G of EI is my VI. Okay, very simple. I have this Poisson Dirichlet, which is a process of weights. And now I just put the, this weight on every one of the, let's say, the basis vectors. Okay. And I will also define something else which will be useful here, little g of gi, which will be gi. And these guys, are, I, I, so this is Poisson Dirichlet, and this, these are n01. All right. So this will be useful. So of course now I have defined this Gaussian, this Gibbs measure, this random Gibbs. It's random, of course, because the weights are random. The support of G is just the collection of this guy, so this is not random. And of course, what is the overlap? The overlap is trivial. What is the overlap? So now you can take a collection of replica. As we've all, always done. And of course, the replica are just orthonormal vectors, that's all they are. And so what are the overlap? The overlap of two replica, it's sigma L, sigma L prime, and this is of course one of L equal L prime. One of sigma L, I'm sorry, equal sigma L prime. Right, because these guys are, the support are just this uh, orthon orthonormal vectors. So, of course, their inner product is either one or zero, or when sigma, is, sigma L is sigma L prime, or when it's zero when it's not. So the structure of the overlap matrix for this G is very simple. Right, it's just made of zeros and ones. All right, so not very, very complicated object. All right, so now with this thing here, I introduce the GT. So I have this Gibbs measure, and now I will have a slight variation of it. This variation and this parameter T will be important. So it's simple. GT of EI will simply be my G of EI, which was VI. You could write this. Exponential t of g of e i, which is g i, divided by the sum of these guys. Okay, so I do exactly the variation I had over there. So for every parameter t now, I move a little bit the weight. I keep the I keep the support to be the same, but I move a little bit the weight. Okay, so I'll call this, I don't know, VIT, as I did over there. All right, so now from this invariance that I wrote there, you deduce, then you can prove the following. Expected value of, this is the average under G, GT infinity, of a function of the whole overlap matrix of size N, product from L smaller than N of the G of sigma L minus T zeta to the KL for any family of KL. T, please read this here, this is important. So this bracket T means I'm taking the average under GT infinity, okay? So remember, we have this measure which depends on T we take an infinite series of replica, create the overlap matrix, take any function of it, multiply by this, looks like a strange object. This is equal to the same thing without T.
So what I'm saying here is that this thing does not depend on t. Right? So this is a direct consequence of this. Right? The vit times the g, this couple has the same distribution as this thing. And this object here obviously only depends on this distribution. So this is a fact. This, now, so here in this, in this thing, you take any n, any number of, rep so this is the, the, the overlap of size n by n. And here, the, um, you take any powers that you want. So in particular, if you choose k1 to be uh, non-zero and all the others, k2, to be zero, and you plug in this thing, what you find is, uh, as a theorem, is you find the following. One, so you, you just specialize this formula, which is a consequence of this invariance. And you find the following. The, um, expectation of f of r1 n plus 1. It's easy to specialize here. Let's say of f of rn r1 n plus 1 is 1 over n expectation of f expectation of r1 2 plus 1 over n sum of expectation of f r12. Just specialize. And 2, expectation of r12 is so what is this? This is, of course, R12 is either 1 or 0. Yeah, maybe I should say that. This tells you something very interesting. Right? If you take the functional order parameter here, which is the distribution of one element of this matrix out of the diagonal, this distribution now, since the overlap can, be only the can take only the value 0 or 1, this distribution, in fact, is, has, is described by only one number. When you have a distribution carried by 0 and 1, it is described by one number, which is the probability of 1 or the mean. Right? So the distribution of this, this entirely correct, in this case, in this simple case, this entirely characterizes the distribution of the overlap, R12, because that's just the mean. And this mean is easy to compute. And it's in, so that's the probability that sigma 1 equals sigma 2. And uh, this is just, so this is expectation of 1 of sigma 1 equals sigma 2. And that's easy to compute. Right? You have these, what is the probability? You have these orthogonal vectors. You take and each of them as a weight v. Now you take two of them independently. What is the probability that they are the same? Probably they are all E1, the two of them are E1 is V1 times V1. So it's V1 squared. The probability that both of them are V2 are, are E2 is V2 times V2. So this is of course simply sum of VI squared. This thing. And of course, which you have to average. Right? If you take two of them, the probability that they are the same is VI squared, and you have to sum of the VI squared. And this, we've seen what it is. This is 1 minus zeta. This is still written, this was written somewhere. So using this invariance property, I've done two things. Just trust, but the second part is trivial. The first part takes a little bit of thinking from this, but, but it's true. So what does 1 say? So what I've proved it now is, so where are we? With this construction of the Gibbs measure from the Poisson, so let me summarize. We know now what the Poisson Dirichlet process is. Now I create a measure on the sphere of a, of a separable Hilbert space by putting the weight of the Dirichlet, Poisson Dirichlet to each of the, I, to, to each of the vectors, the basis vector, right? I've created a thing like this. From this, I create the, 
the uh, overlap distribution matrix, which is made only of zeros and ones. And what I've proved here is that I, I can see that this is exactly Guerlanda Guerra. So we know that the matrix, the distribution of R, the distribution of this infinite matrix R satisfies Guerlanda Guerra. This is one. This is exactly Guerlanda Guerra. It, maybe it doesn't look like it initially. Because in my Guerlanda Guerra, I had a function, any function of R12, or R1n plus 1. But remember, here my, my R can take, on, can take only two values, 0, 1. So I, any function is essentially R. Right? You don't have a, a million function and a variable that takes only the value 0 or 1. So this is, in fact, Guerlanda Guerra. And second, the functional order parameter that is the distribution of R, one, two, one element, is given by, by its mean. You just need one parameter, and this is just one minus zeta. Right? This R, one, two is zero or one, and its mean, which is, of course, the probability of being one, is 1 minus zeta. So here I have constructed, so let's pose now. I promised one example of Guerlanda Guerra. Here's one, right? A, a stupid one, maybe, but it works, right? You, you have this thing on the, on, on the ball, on the sphere of a, of a separable space. It satisfies Guerlanda Guerra, and it's a trivial case where the distribution is simply 0, 1. And you have one for every z value of the parameter zeta. So I have an infinite family of them. And you see how the zeta intervenes here in the mean, or the probability of one, if you want. OK? This is, of course, also the probability. This is one. Right? So your zeta now has 0 or 1. All right? And the probability of 0 is zeta. It's important to notice here this. This is, this is, of course, now zeta. The probability of 1 is 1 minus zeta. The probability of 0 is zeta. It's crucial to notice that it's strictly positive. In all these models, there is an atom at 0 and an atom at 1. OK, of mass zeta and 1 minus zeta. All right? So from this, in fact, there is the, this characterization, because we, we, we know that in general from the Guerlanda Guerra thing, that if you have one and two, then the distribution of the weights VI is Poisson Dirichlet. So these two properties, in fact, characterize the Poisson Dirichlet. Okay, so you have one parameter for Poisson Dirichlet and for this guy, and that's all. I could have said the following. I want to construct something for which the functional order parameter is the simplest possible, which is two atoms. Right? And this could have been an uh, uh, the reason to introduce Poisson Dirichlet. If you know, if you don't know anything, you want to construct one, this tells you, in fact, when you do that, you construct Poisson Dirichlet. All right, good. But as I just said, this is kind of uh, weak because we've, you know, we're supposed to have any distribution zeta for, the R, for R12, and now we have only a thing with one atom. So the next thing, of course, is to go to Ruel probability cascade. So we build on this. So let me introduce what they are, maybe, and, and then we'll see that this does the trick for a general situation. So this now takes some, uh, this is a step, a serious step. So I begin by constructing, so I look at this, the, the space of, I want to look at the set n to the r. r will be a number, an integer number. 
And I want to look at the sequence. So this, what are this? This uh, something is there, is, if it can be written as alpha 1, alpha r, and the alpha i's are integers. This doesn't look like a very interesting object, but I want to look at this as the leaves of a tree, of an infinitary tree. Okay, so how do I do that? I look at the set A, which is n, zero, n to the power 0. So n to the power 0 for me would mean simply one point. It will be the, the root of my tree. I look at this, union n, union n square, et cetera, union n to the r. And now I look at this as a tree. So a point, so this whole thing I can look at as an infinitary tree. So let me draw this so that you can see that. So I have a root, so of course it's impossible to draw infinite trees, but then I have here the integers. So if you want, this is one, two, three, n. So here I put n. So this is n0 and this is n. Okay, now under this guy, I put again the whole one, two, three. Okay, and again here, one, two, three, etc. Under each of these. This is a way, and, and then of course, if I go to level R, my point here will be an alpha, which will be a certain alpha one, alpha two alpha r, and of course these guys tells, tell me how I climb up here, right? So for each, so here I've parameterized n to the r, and I want to see this as a tree. I want to see the ultrametric structure in it. So I'll define, so for an alpha, which is alpha 1, alpha p in n to the p, I define two things. I will define p, the length of this thing, to be this. So for any point in this tree somewhere, this goes down like this, any point here, P means simply the, the level. And I'll define P alpha, which is N1. So let's, uh, I'm sorry, maybe I should have called that N1 and P because they're integers. I have N1, N1, N2. N1, N2, N3, et cetera. So, so what is that? If, if it's just the path that goes down. Right? It's just the list of the people. So that's the path that goes from root to alpha. All right. Now, what do I do with this? For each alpha. So first I choose now a collection, say of z zero smaller than zeta zero of numbers, zeta r minus one smaller than one. Okay? So I choose a number zeta as I had before for each level. Right? And I, now I do the following. For each For each alpha in this A minus N R, that is, I don't take a leaf, I take any point above the leaves, all those levels, I choose, let's say, a pi alpha, which is a Poisson Dirichlet, a, I'm sorry, a Poisson point process of measure mu zeta alpha. Right? Mu zeta, I'm sorry. And this zeta is zeta alpha. Like this. Depends only on the, on the level. All right? So what does that mean? At the root, I choose one Poisson Dirichlet of, with a zeta, which is zeta zero. At each of these points here, I fix a Poisson Dirichlet independently, IIDs, with a parameter zeta, which is zeta 1. At each of these, 
Same thing with zeta 2, etc. And I stop one level above this. All right? Then, I look at, then define the weights. I have to define the weights. So you define W alpha. Now when alpha is anywhere in the tree but the root, to be the product of these U betas, which are these guys, along the path. Do you get that? So let me say that again. Here, I choose a Poisson Dirichlet, OK, with parameter zeta 0. And then I put them here. I put the weights on these guys. Or if you want the Poisson point process, I put the weights on these guys. Then here, I choose another Poisson Dirichlet with parameter zeta 1, and I put the weights here. Right, same thing here, etc. So I have a weight at every vertex, and when I go down to any point, I just do the, the weight is just a product of these guys along the path. All right. And finally, I define v alpha to be w alpha divided by the sum of w betas. And here I do that for the the last thing. So again, for, for this last generation, I take a point here. And I define the, the, this probability measure by just taking the weight, which is the product of all these weights along the, along the path, and I normalize. OK? So this is my V. So this guy here will be defined as the weights of the Ruel probability cascade. So this will be the weights of the Ruel probability cascade, or I will say Ruel cascades, if you want. And so for every such collection, I've defined a Ruel cascade. Right? So I see that everybody's like, ah. it's a pretty heavy object, but it's, it's what it is. All right? So before, what did we have? When we had the Poisson Dirichlet, had one level. Right? When I had the Poisson Dirichlet before, I just had one level. I had one guy had chosen the Poisson Dirichlet. And, I, and of course, the product of one object is just itself. So the, then it corresponded to, the, to this situation where I had only one zeta, which was between 0 and 1. Right? And now I keep on doing that. Under each of these guys, I redo the same thing, etc. And then I just multiply the weights. And this define this object. All right? So before saying anything, because I have to, to close, let me, uh, you know, at this point, I have weights, but I still don't have the overlap structure. I have to inject this on the Hilbert space, right? These, remember, was, were the weights, and I have to put that on a Hilbert space. So injecting this in a Hilbert space to define my probability structure. So how do I do that? I take again my Hilbert space, but here I will just assume that my eigen, I'm sorry, my orthonormal vectors will be indexed by this A. Right? So I, I, I look at here vectors which are indexed by this. And this defines, of course, uh, I mean, they can, this, in fact, is finite dimensional because my A is finite here. So, of course, I can find this in a Hilbert space. Then what I do is I define the H alpha, that's the important thing, to be sum of the E beta, these, I, these vectors, when beta is along the path of an alpha, multiplied by something. And the something will be q beta minus q beta minus 1 to the power 1 half. And I haven't introduced what the q's are. Left room here. Of course, here, the q will be, I need this to have, a, this was not defining a functional parameter. 
because I didn't know what the place was. So I need Q0 to QR. Um, and, and so this will be my, uh, so what I do is the following. I take a point, I look at the, in fact, at the vec so I define how I define the weight. It's just the product of the weights. And to define the vector on which it will be carried, I just do a, a sum of those vec vectors here multiplied by those components here, which are the square root of q minus q minus 1. So, and then the weight of this will simply be my v alpha, which I just defined here. So now I've injected this on, in the ball of a, unit, of, of a Hilbert space. But now this is way more interesting because these vectors now are not simply, the overlap is not 0, 1. What is the overlap of two such vectors? So the overlap of H alpha and H beta is very simple. It's this Q at alpha wedge beta, where alpha wedge beta is simply the cardinal of the path here, the intersection of the two paths. So let me explain what this is. If you have an alpha here and a beta here, then you have the, the, the path of this guy that comes in. Okay, it doesn't look like a tree, but, and they meet at some point here. And alpha wedge beta is the length of this. Right? It's the number of levels they share in common, right? So it measures, in some sense, the distance of their last common ancestor. The last common ancestor, the distance from the root. Okay, so that's what it is. And this H is Q of this. So it's the Q at this level. Right? So this, by definition, has an ultrametric structure. This is, of course, ultrametric. So I've created an ultrametric thing with weights. Okay, so this is definitely ultrametric. It's clear. This is, in fact, I injected a tree. This tree, I injected it on the unit sphere. So I, I forced it there. The ultrametricity is there. And the uh, important thing, maybe I, uh, okay, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Maybe I should say the following. So just in words, because it's really late. When I look at this G, G satisfies, so maybe this is a theorem. The G I just defined, this G or the R, if you want, satisfies Guerra. Well so now if you look, again, you take a, a collection of replica under this measure Z, G, you look at the, rep the replica, ma the overlap matrix, it satisfies Gerland Aguera. That is, the distribution of the whole thing is determined by the distribution of one. And second, the distribution of the functional order parameter is the measure defined by this. It's sum of zeta i plus one minus zeta i, Dirac mass at qi. Right? These two collections define a discrete probability measure on 0, 1, where the difference of the zetas are the atom, are the masses, and the qi's are the locations of the atoms. So if we think for a minute about this, this means the following. If I give myself one functional, one functional order parameter, which is a discrete measure, and at this point, so, as a consequence, for any discrete measure, by discrete I mean zeta on 0, 1, right? Which say is given by this. Here, with the caveat that I need that zeta of 0 is positive. This is not very important, but that's, right? For any discrete me measure like this, we prove that there exists a random measure G on a Hilbert space such that 
gu lambda, the functional order parameter is zeta, and so, gu lambda gu error. So I satisfy what I said before. You give me any finite measure, any discrete measure, there exists a way to realize it through a random measure there. Right? And, and the way is this real cascade. All right? So that's really the important thing. And there is something which looks like technical, but in fact, so this G is, of course, not unique. Remember, I could do any orthogonal transformation and I would still satisfy that. For instance, just permute, randomly permute the EIs, and of course you would still have this. But what is unique, the distribution of R, of the infinite overlap matrix, is unique. And we know that. We already know that. Because we know that when you have Guerlanda Guerra, which is a property of R, when you have Guerlanda Guerra, the distribution of the whole matrix is determined by the distribution of one element. So here I'm saying I know the distribution of one element, and I know the distribution of the, and I know it's Guerlanda Guerra, so I know the distribution of the whole thing. Okay? So this is not exactly true. There's one thing which is a little problematic, which is what happens on the, on the diagonal. And which is... But, so outside of the diagonal, the whole distribution of R is uniquely determined. Right? So not only have we... This is crucial. Not only have we created this infinite family, this family for any probability measure zeta of things that satisfy Guerlain Guerra, but they are in fact unique in the space of, so they are the only one. And suddenly, if we believe that these spin glasses are supposed to be ultrametric and satisfy Guerlain Guerra, they have to be one of these. And so that, of course, is kind of gives a headache because how is that related, you know. This construction is purely abstract. I've constructed this family, I've done all this thing, and I have done nothing, Penchenko has, but, uh, you know. And then, and then I say it's unique, so any dis if, if we believe and if we prove that, the, that for spin glasses the limiting object is Guerlanda Guerra, satisfied Guerlanda Guerra, it's one of these, except for one point. Nothing tells us that the measure should be discrete a priori. So we have to think of that. And then, of course, there is something which is very nice. Moreover, the distribution of R out of the diagonal, I mean, you don't want the diagonal term, is weakly continuous with respect to the convergence of zeta with respect to zeta. Which means if you have zeta n, which converge to a zeta, then the, the r corresponding to the zeta n converge to the, the distribution, the r corresponding to the zeta, out of the diagonal. So this is very crucial, converge to something which will, of course, still satisfy Guerlanda Guerra. So let's see how that is important. Now take any distribution zeta, not finite, right? one with a continuous part. You can, of course, always approximate it by a discrete object. Right? And if, since you know that this will converge, then you have defined an overlap structure that will satisfy Guerlanda Guerra because Guerlanda Guerra will go to the limit and that will be, will have the proper functional order parameter. And again, it will be uniquely determined because it satisfies Guerlanda Guerra. So you know, how, you know that there exists now for any measured zeta such an object, right, which satisfies Guerlanda Guerra and which has this zeta as a functional order parameter. Okay. There's a little caveat here is th there was this thing about the mass at zero 
But that's no big deal because you can always, always approximate any measure, even if the mass is zero, is zero for this, you can always put a little atom at zero so that you can define it. And there's another thing to be said, as I mentioned, the thing out of the diagonal. Why about, what about the diagonal? Obviously, the diagonal will not be continuous with respect to weak convergence. Because remember, the diagonal is carried by the maximal point of the support of zeta. And the maximum of a support of a probability measure is not continuous with respect to weak convergence. Right? So you have to work a little bit with that. So you have to do something in this approximation, but that's not very crucial. Okay? So with this, we are at the following point. For any functional order parameter, that is any distribution in the interval 0, 1, Remember, these are the objects that intervene in the Parisi formula. We can construct an overlap distribution, one of these infinite matrices, which satisfies Guerlain Aguera and has this as a functional order parameter. All right? And, and it, it is given by one of these Ruel cascade. The question is, why would that be related? How is that supposed to be related to, to Parisi. So the dream would be the following. Imagine that in the Parisi, so how is the Parisi formula? So what I'm saying now is the whole conclusion of all this. Imagine that, the, so the Parisi formula is an infimum on zeta, on this probability distribution. Imagine for a moment that this minimum, this infimum is achieved at a certain zeta. Then, and, and then even imagine, go further, imagine it's achieved uniquely. You have one zeta. Then what you think would be true, that's what Parisi says, in fact, is that then the, the Gibbs measure should converge in this sense. That is, you create this overlap matrix for the Gibbs measure. It should converge to the Poisson, to the, Dirich, to the Ruel cascade with overlap parameter zeta, with functional order parameter zeta. To the, I mean, not to the cascade, but to the overlap structure defined by the cascade. Why? Because you know, if you have a limit, it should satisfy, I mean, it will be one of these. And it should satisfy, I mean, of course, you have to prove Gorland Aguera. If you can prove Gorland Aguera, then the limit should satisfy Gorland Aguera and has, have this as a functional order parameter, so it should be uniquely determined, and it should be one of these. Right? So that's the picture that you know, carries the day. The problem is, of course, we don't know it converges. We don't know it's uniquely satisfied. We know nothing. Right? We don't, you know, remember when we constructed this overlap structure, we said it has limit points. At this point, we don't know that it has a unique limit or that it converges to anything. But if we knew all that, that would be really the picture. Then, even, with, even there, we will still be very far from the final result. The final result would be to understand the phase diagram. That is to understand, depending on the temperature and maybe the external field, what is zeta? What is this thing? Right? And that we don't know. So what, here is the, what the wisdom, the common wisdom says. In high temperature, Zeta should just be the Dirac mass at zero. That's called the replica symmetric region. Dirac mass at zero. The overlap is always zero because it's like uniform measure. You take two, two replica, they're always orthogonal. Then you should get into a replica symmetry breaking thing, which means zeta is no longer Dirac mass at zero. And then you have essentially two classes, the finite replica symmetry breaking schemes, which means that zeta is discrete and you count the number of levels. So if you have two atoms, it's one step of replica symmetry breaking. One atom is replica symmetric. Two atoms is one step. Three atoms is three steps, etc. And if zeta, in fact, the unique zeta is, has a continuous part, you call that full replica symmetry breaking. Okay? What is expected is if you take the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, P equal two, that you have, let's say, no external magnetic field. This can, can, so just purely, the temp you have only the temperature. You have a high temperature regime where it's replica symmetric, the definition I gave, and the low temperature regime where it's full. 
and you jump from one to the other. So suddenly it becomes, you have this continuous Dirichlet uh, uh, Ruel cascade, if you want. When p is larger than 3, or equal to 3, when you take a p-spin model, pure, what you expect is that you have replica symmetry, so zeta is concentrated in 0. Then you have a region of lower temperature where you have one step replica symmetry breaking. And then an even lower temperature where you have full. You don't have two step replica or three step. So zero step, one step, full. This is not proven. This, is, this goes back to Elizabeth Gardner's result in the 80s or 90s, no, 80s, I think, it's physics level. And there is nothing in the math, I mean, at least as far as I know. Uh, that, now, if you take a mixture of P-spins, all hell breaks loose. And what happens? You can have one step replica symmetry working, or, or the, the common wisdom is that you never have, in this kind of model, you don't have two step replica symmetry breaking, but one only, or four. In, so let me tell you what is known about the spherical case. A little more is known, because as you remember, I gave you the Parisi formula, I think, for the, the chrysanthi sommers formula for the replica, for the spherical case, which is much simpler. So for the spherical case, it is known that if you take p larger or equal to 3, and now, before it was only for p even, now it's for every p, for pure p spin, for spherical case, p equal 2 is trivial. Let's not even mention it. It's a stupid model. It's not at all hard like Sheridan and Kirkpatrick. I shouldn't say stupid because I, I wrote you know, long papers on, on it, but it's, uh, it's not hard. For p larger than 3, it is supposed to be, it is proven to be pure, uh, to be one step replica symmetry breaking at all lower temperature. So you don't have this phase where it's supposed to be. And for a high temperature, of course, replica symmetry breaking. But now, when you mix two spherical models, take you mix a, two, a p equal 2 and a p equal 4, or a p equal 4 and a p equal 10, then depending on the parameters, you're supposed to go from one step replica symmetry breaking to full. And in fact, there are even, I won't go there, but there are two kinds of full which I don't want to describe, all right? So all this is up in the air. For the spherical, we know that pure P-spins are one-step replica symmetry breaking at low temperature. But if I, if I give you a mixture of two or three, nobody knows. Except for the results we have at zero temperature with Tuca, which I explained here two years ago. And, and maybe I'll, I'll give some quick explanation of what this is now, which are the first indication that really something, there is a transition in the, in the, pu in the, in the mixed case between, in, between one RSB and full RSB. So the real next step, I mean, there are, even if you accept all that, because that is now clear, the real next step of this is to understand convergence. All that are just limit points. Characterization of the limit, that's what it is. Convergence of, of some sort uniqueness, uniqueness of the minimum, and, and then, more importantly, decide for what temperature you have one step replica symmetry breaking or full or whatever. And this is incredibly, but it's, it's completely open yet. Of course, not completely. At high temperature, you have lots of results to prove that it's replica symmetric. But at low temperature, deciding whether it's one, one step or two step or full, it's open. So, I believe it's a good time to get into this problem, which is the real problem. Because now that, before there was this formalism, what can you do? But there is even one more question, which is more fundamental, which is the following. You have this discrete spin glass model. You have these objects. And for the, for the moment, they don't touch. Right? There's no reason. They have nothing to do one with the other, except that in the limit, you know, the, the, it would be you know, interesting to understand you know, something more practical in some sense, how they get, how, why, why are they over there? 
what does that really mean? Because otherwise you will have something like this. You will have the overlap structure is defined by your, by your, by your Ruel cascade. But what I want, because I'm not interested, in fact, that might come as a, come as a surprise, I'm not interested by this, by the equilibrium. I'm more ambitious, I'm interested by dynamics. When you want to understand dynamics, you want to understand not only the fact that this thing is organized ultrametrically on the, on the sphere, but how it is organized. What kind of you know, energy barriers you have between two deep points, etc. And this is not contained in this picture. So you need more. You need more than just this picture to understand, for instance, how these things move. And, and it would be interesting to, to, to have a real coupling between these two objects. In some sense, this is like the following thing. Here's the analogy. You're working on a, a complicated random walk. Let's correlate a complicated random walk. And on the other hand, you know how to, to work on Brownian motion. You know, simple random walks, and, and it's limited Brownian motion. Then you prove that your very complicated random walk has properties such that its possible limit points must be, say, I don't know, Gaussian and uh, independent increments. That plays the role of Guerlain Guerra, if you want. So because of these properties, which are true only in the limit, then the limit has to be Gaussian. So it has to be the same limit as the, the trivial model. But of course, you know, you you never relate the trivial models, and maybe this trivial model is not the right one. But you would under, it would be nice if you really want to understand, not simply that the limit is, Ga is Brownian, but to understand some kind of discrete model in which you have simplified very much the original thing. So these discrete models, what I'm just saying here, in this context here of spin glasses, this line of thought was Derrida's thought at the beginning of the 80s, 30 years ago. So Bernard Derrida, invented the GREM, a generalized random energy model, as kind of natural models that would go to these guys and that can, could be kind of close to the, to the true models. So the GREM, GREM means generalized random energy model, a nice discrete model, but it just appeared after a lot of years that they are not, they look like tr easy, but they are not. So, for instance, to prove that the Graham converged to this Poisson Dirichlet, to this Ruel cascade, was made by Anton Bovier and Irina Kurkova. And for Ruel, it was supposed to be trivial. It's probably, that's what he had in mind. It was a very, very serious piece of work. It was not easy. One thing. The other part is, which has been a long effort of many people, including, uh, for instance, Erwin Bolthausen to see how this discrete object, the Graham, the simpler object, are close to some true spin glass model, this essentially is very, very difficult too. So it might not be the right road, but uh, so maybe the right road is to understand the structure deeper, the, Poisson, the, the, the Ruel cascade deeper, in terms of how they're organized on the, the support of the measure on the, on the, on the, on the sphere. And, uh, okay, that's just perspective. So next time I will conclude with all this, maybe talk a little bit about, uh, about the spherical case. And uh, of course I have to indicate a little bit how this is related to the, because this is not only related to the spirit of the Parisi formula, it, it's also the basic tool for the Parisi formula, for the proof of the Parisi formula. So I have to indicate this quickly. And then after that, maybe next time and then time after that, and then I will, I will go to dynamics study how you converge to equilibrium on this, or how you don't converge to equilibrium on these things.